Christ. Now, we'll finish up the week before homecoming, but uh, well, I'm going to give you a, 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 a preview of what next week's going to be. So next week, if you've got any lost friends or somebody you don't know, next week would be the perfect time to invite them. Because the last question we're going to finish up with is, how are you to avoid being sentenced to hell? We'll be back in the, today, we're in Matthew chapter 23. Well, we'll be in Matthew chapter 23 as, as well next week. But how do we in, in, avoid being sentenced to hell? So that's a, that, that'll be our last question that we'll finish up with. But we've been uh, in these questions. Some of the questions may not exactly pertain uh, to what we, what we look at, but... Jesus gives us so many uh, things that as he asks them, they can, they're, they're a question that may pertain to one thing, but yet we can apply them to our lives. We can apply them so much to our hearts. And the question we're going to talk about today, what is greater? You know, I remember the... I remember in, in school we used to have the little the little signs, the little greater than and less than, and I, so many times it's hard for us to understand. And as kids, I remember looking at those signs and trying to remember which one meant greater and lesser than. And and, and now we see these signs that uh, he greater than I signs and things like that. But today we're going to look at it from a question that he brought up in Matthew chapter 23 verse 16 now in this chapter in Matthew chapter 23 just to give you a little bit of a background he is addressing the Pharisees and sat and the and the scribes and he's talking to them and so much from the beginning of the chapter to the end of the chapter he is giving them a hard time about their hypocrisies so many times and and Folks, as, as churches and as Christians today, you know, that's one of the things that, uh, that the people out there, that's one of the things they have the most problem with about people in church, is, is they're, they're full of hypocrites. And the truth of the matter is, we're all hypocritical to some degree. I, we try not to be. Now, there are some people in churches that, and this... this this is where they get it. There's a lot of preachers in churches. There's a lot of Christians in churches that come to church and they have that holier-than-thou attitude. And they, they want to tell you all about your sins and they want to tell you, and, and yet they don't, want to up, they, they don't want to admit to them themselves. And that's where the scribes and the Pharisees were. And we see that in churches a lot today. And, and people, therefore, they have a bad attitude toward churches and the hypocrites within them. But I'll be the first one to tell you as Paul said, I'm chiefest among sinners. And, and yes, I will point out that there are sins. And I will, I will not back down from saying something is sin. But at the same time, I will never tell you that I'm not as much a sinner as you are. But Jesus, as he spoke to the, the scribes and Pharisees, he told them a lot of things that they were doing that was wrong. A lot of things that they were doing that they were, they were failing at upholding the law. But yet they were trying to hold the people to a higher standard than they were living to themselves. But in Matthew chapter 16, or chapter 23, verse 16, he says this, he says, Woe to you, blind guides! Who say, whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind. For which is greater, the gold of the temple that sanctifies it, the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by all things on it. 
He who swears by the temple swears by it, and by, the, by him who dwells in it. And who who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. We look at this, and as Jesus is approaching the, the, the scribes and Pharisees, he gives them a, a little bit about swearing. Now, he's not talking about cussing. You know, we, that's what we, the swear words, we, somebody swear, that's not what he's talking about. We're just going to cover this part real quick about swearing. Because so many people, they feel like they've got to, oh, I, I, I swear to God. I swear to God it's true. I swear by my mama's grave, or I swear by, I, I, I swear by the heavens. I swear by the temple. I, well, here's what was going on. Now, get this. This makes absolutely no sense, but this is what they were doing. If they said, I swear by the altar, or I swear by the temple, they felt like they were not obliged to uphold it. If, if I swear by the temple, then I, I really don't have to fulfill it. But if I swear by the gold in the temple, or I swear by the, the sacrifice that's on the altar, then, then, I've got, then I'm obliged to it. I've got to uphold it. That in itself is hypocrisy. Go back to James chapter 5, verse 12. He says, But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. Why do I need to swear? Why do, you, why do people feel that they need to swear by heaven or by earth or by anything else? The thing is, as James tells us here, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Listen, if you are trustworthy, if people know you, if people, if you have a good reputation, there's no reason to swear. That always bothered me. When you'd go into the, a courtroom, now at least today in a courtroom, I don't know if any of you have been in a courtroom lately, uh, but every time I've been, I've been, I've been as a, uh, uh, a, a witness on a few different occasions. And you just raise your right hand. They don't make you put your hand on the Bible anymore. They don't do that. But you, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. They used to make you lay your hand on the Bible. But they don't even do that anymore. And... The thing is, is if we're of good reputation, it, it, we, there's no reason to swear, and that's what James is addressing here, that there's no reason to. But, but even Jesus himself in the Sermon on the Mount told us in verse 33 of chapter 5, he says, Again, you have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oath to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes and your no be no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. So Jesus told, us here, told them here in the Sermon on the Mount that, he, that even the, the feeling that you need to swear is from the evil one. It comes from Satan itself. You can't, you, we can't swear by God because we, we're not God. We can't affect God. We can't swear by heaven because it's his throne. We can't swear by earth because it's his footstool. I like what he said here. You can't even swear by yourself or on your own head. He could have put this in here because I can't even make one grow on my head. You can't make one white or black. Now, I know that some people, 
I'm not naming any names, but some people have tried to make them white or black. They have changed the color, but let me tell you something. Leave it alone for a little while, and it'll change back. We can't affect. We, we can't even affect ourselves. How can we swear by anything? And that's what Jesus tells us. We, don't, we have no need to let our yeses be yeses and our noes be no. Live a life of, of trustworthiness. Live a life that people, that people will believe you. That's what he was getting at with that. And that's what the Pharisees were being guilty of. But that's not the point I want to cover today. We're going to look at the gold. We're going to look at the sacrifice. What makes things great? I had a call the other day. I've, I've bought a little bit of, of silver in the past few years. I, I just enjoy buying silver. I try to catch it when it's low, and I'll, I'll buy some silver. And I, I like, to, I like to, to, to have it, you know, a little bit of extra here and there. And, and um, so this guy that, that works at one of the uh, place called Universal Coin down in Texas, he calls me every month or so. Acts like we're best friends when he calls, you know. And he always starts out with, get a pen and write this down. 1993, Gold Eagle, $25 coin. And he always tries to give me this big sales pitch. I looked it up, and, I, and every time he calls me, I'll, I'll talk to him for a little bit. And I've bought a few things that he's tried to sell me, but he gives me this sales pitch, and I look it up as he's giving it to me. But I checked last night, gold, an ounce of gold, spot price, $2,509 right now for one ounce of gold. But he called me the other day, and he's trying to sell me this piece of gold, an ounce of gold for right out $5,000 for this ounce of gold. But here's the thing. It's worth it. Now, I wasn't going to pay that for it, but it's worth it. Now, gold itself is only worth $2,500 an ounce. I, I say only, but that's still pretty high. But what made this piece of gold that he's trying to sell me worth it is because it's a rare piece. It is in a case and it is a proof set and it is rated at uh, PF70 or whatever the ratings that he tried to sell me on. And it's a 1993 gold coin and it's, it's rare. But it's a mint piece. And because it is a special piece of gold, it is worth more than a regular piece of gold. Now see, I'm, I'm, when I buy silver, here's what I do. I, I buy it for its silver value, so therefore I look for the cheapest things. They're always trying to sell me on these proof sets and this MS69 and up and all this. And I, I have bought a few, and they cost about double what a regular piece of silver costs. Because of the rarity of it and because of the making and the mint and all that, all that different things. But gold in itself, just a piece of gold, pure gold, is only worth $2,509 in the gold value. And Jesus says here, what is more valuable, the gold? Or the temple. Now see, they're swearing by the temple and they say nothing, it's nothing special. But if they swear by the gold in the temple, they're saying it's special. Well, let me tell you something. You take that gold outside the temple and it's just a piece of gold. It's just an ordinary piece of gold. You set it outside the temple. What makes that gold in the temple special. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 16 says, 
For now I have chosen and sanctified this house. That my name may be forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. What made that gold special is the fact that God said, I have sanctified this house. I have sanctified this house and I've put my name on this house. At the date that they opened that house, His Spirit filled it so, so thick they couldn't go in. And you, anything that was within it, anything in that temple, is sanctified to the Lord. And that's what gives that gold its value. That's what gives that gold, makes that gold special. Any other gold right now is worth $2,509 an ounce. But the gold in the temple was a special gold. It was a gold that money can't value what is sanctified to God. Money can't value what, what that kind of thing brings. You see, God, when He sanctified the temple, Solomon filled the temple with gold. The things in the temple, a lot of it was made with gold. The Ark of the Covenant was covered in gold. The mercy seat was covered in gold. But that gold... If it wasn't on the mercy seat, here, here's the thing. You know where that gold that was put on the ark and on the mercy seat came from? It came from the people of Egypt who gave it to the Israelites. And they turned in their earrings and their necklaces and their bracelets to make, to cover the ark and to put within. Listen, there, that gold was gold that came out of Egypt. It was gold that had no other value until it was placed on that ark, until it was placed on that mercy seat. And then it became something valuable. It became something that was sanctified. And Jesus said, so, so why are you swearing by the, the gold in the temple? The temple is what's got the value. The temple is what gives the gold its value. I don't know about you all. But I love a good steak. I love a good roast. And the sacrifices that were put on the altar were just a piece of meat. You take them and you slaughter a, a bull, you slaughter a sheep, you slaughter a goat, whatever you slaughter, when you kill it, it's just a piece of meat. Now we know that some pieces of meat is more valuable than others. It's all in the seasoning. But it's all, some of it, you, know, you, you buy a filet and it's going to be more valuable than a sirloin. But it's still just a piece of meat until it's offered. Until it is given to the Lord, until it is placed upon His altar, then that is just a piece of meat. But get this. Even if it's placed upon his altar and placed there with the wrong intentions, it's still just a piece of meat. 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 22 tells us, So Samuel said, has the, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than the sacrifice. And to heed than the fat of the rams. So even if the sacrifice is given in the wrong spirit, it's still just a piece of meat. But listen, it is the obedience of giving that sacrifice. It is the obedience of placing it on the altar. It is the obedience of, of giving it to the Lord that makes that sacrifice of any value. Without that altar, without giving it to the Lord, and without making a, the, the, the offering to Him then it's just a piece of meat and has no value. But yet the, the Pharisees and the scribes were holding a, the 
the sacrifice itself at a greater value than the altar to God. It's the, offer, it's, it's the offering it to God that makes it a value. It's the obedience to God that makes it a value. Matter of fact, in, in Psalm chapter 51, which is the, the psalm of repentance that David gave, in verse 16 he says, For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in the burnt offering. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. So what David says here and what Samuel says here, even that piece of meat, even the sacrifice that's given to God, still is no more value than any other piece of meat unless it's given with a contrite heart, unless it's given with a broken spirit, unless it is given to God. In other words, giving it to God is all that gives it value. Everything that has value comes from the Lord. What makes, what makes anything we have great is that it comes from the Lord or that it's given to the Lord. Nothing else in life has value. Even us. What are you worth? See, that brings us to this. When, we, when we're looking at and we're asking this question, what makes, the, what makes the gold valuable? What makes the sacrifice valuable? It's the temple and the sacrifice itself or the altar. So what brings us value? There are people all over this world. We, 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 we call them tree huggers. But there's people all over this world that worship trees. They worship Mother Earth. There are religions that worship cattle. And all other kinds of things. You know, when, the, when, when they first came to America, and the, the Native Americans, they, they, they worshipped the wind, and they worshipped the spirit gods, and they worshipped all these other things. There are people, there are things that worship the creation but ignore the Creator. Listen, everything that we have, we've talked about it before, but everything you look outside, the grass, the trees, they're all there for us. The food, the, the animals, everything is for us. It was all created for us. But yet we don't worship those things because they're of nothing without God. We are the same way. We are nothing without God. We are a creation just like the, the plants. We are a created being. We are created by God. And therefore we are of nothing. We are of no value without Him. Psalm chapter 19 verses 1 through 4 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In other words, the heavens, the earth, it all declares God's glory. Yet we as people fail to do so. We as people, we find our value, our value alone is in the Lord. But yet we fail to raise Him up. The, 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 the greatest of His creations is man. But yet, yet man is the only one of His creations that does not continually praise Him. You can't look outside without seeing something to praise God about. You can't, you, you can't find anything in this world that was created by Him that does not give Him glory. I know it's hard to understand how some things, like you know, we, we were talking about how a snake gives God glory. That's hard to understand. I know that. But it does. Some way. 
But we are the only one of His creation that fails to do so. We fail to do it. Why? Because we have too high of opinion of ourselves. For some reason, we all think we're special in some way. Whether it's because we think we look too good, whether we think that we have uh, achieved something, whether it's because of our wealth, because of our success, because of our abilities, because of our position, or because of our good, goodness. Or because we've done some good deeds, we, we think we are special. There's not a person here, there's not a person alive that don't think they're special in some way. And the truth is, we all are special in some way. There's something special about each and every one of us. But I want to tell you a secret. You didn't have anything to do with it. You didn't have anything to do with the thing that makes you special. I'll never forget <laughs> one of the funniest things, and I've told this before, but we were walking into a revival one time over in Irwin. We were going in. Our church was going over there, and we're walking in, and it, and it was over at uh, Chestoa Pike. And there's an old man standing out on the front porch, and, and he made some comment to Christy and the girls. Said something about they looked very nice or they were pretty. And Christy just automatically smiled and said, thank you. And he said, don't thank me. You didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> Listen, if you are pretty, it's not your fault. You might be able to put on some makeup. You might be able to fix your hair. But listen, if you, the beauty is not your fault. If you're smart, you might have studied some. But there's somebody that's not as smart as you that studied a whole lot more somewhere. You didn't have anything to do with it. If you're strong, that ain't your fault. Listen, God made us the way we are. And like I said, we all have something about us that's special that we didn't have anything to do with. Like Yahya over here. He's got a great talent. And I, I know he works at it. He studies. He practices. But listen, when I was a kid, I practiced too. I did. I couldn't get my right hand to work with my left hand. I had a good teacher. My brother, my brother had the same teacher I did, and he could play like crazy. The thing is, is he's, as, even though he's worked hard at it, he has a talent. There are people I know that have a great desire to sing. And they sound like somebody stepping on a cat. <laughs> they, they want to sing. They desire to sing, but they just can't. And then there's some people that don't practice. They never, they've never took a lesson. They've never, and, and, and it just comes out beautiful. Let me tell you something. God gives us all talents of some sort. And we all have something special about us, but it all comes from God. Nothing we have is our own fault. Not even our goodness, not even our good deeds that we do. When it comes to goodness, Isaiah said it best in, verse, in chapter 64. But we are all like an unclean thing. And all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. We're not even good. The best we can do. The best of our righteousness is as filthy rags. We have no value. Aside from God. Everything, just like the gold in the temple was made valuable because it was in the temple. The sacrifice on the altar was made valuable because it was on the altar. We have value. We have, we have specialness. We can even have righteousness because of God 
but because of no other thing, not because of anything we do. So I ask, what is our value? You see, we gotta we gotta be careful. Or what? Sorry, what do you value? I got them out of order here. What do you value in life? You see, we're all guilty of worshiping things. We worship. This is hard. Sometimes we worship our kids. We worship our grandkids. We worship our dogs. We worship our cars. We worship our homes. We worship athletes, actors. We, we worship all kinds of things. And I know we say, we, we, I don't worship those, but what do you spend the most time on? What do you spend the most money on? What do you spend your time thinking about? You see, those are the things, whatever we put first in life is what we value the most. So the question is, is, is what in your life has value? What in your life has the most value? And then, what is your value? How do we think of ourselves? You know, it's real easy to give our, try to give ourselves a pat on the back. It's, it's real easy to seek for somebody else to give us a pat on the back. We, we all like to have it, but the truth of the matter is none of us deserves it. Job. <laughs> Job is, is a man that God put a hedge around Job, and God was Job was the greatest of all his at his time. As a matter of fact, it says that that he would offer a sacrifice just in case one of his kids did something wrong. He was such a good man that God even looked at Satan. Have you have you considered my servant Job? But when the wheels fell off and Job was feeling sorry for himself and his friends were coming around saying, well, maybe you did this, maybe you did that. Job started listing off all the good things he did and started patting himself on the back. And that's when God had to remind him. Everything you have is from me. You're still just a man. What do we where, where is our value? You're just a man, you're just a woman. Our value comes in the fact that we can be paid for by Jesus Christ. All our value comes from God. We can't earn it. We can't be righteous. We can't be holy without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Without that altar that he laid himself upon, we can have no value. But here's the thing. God values us enough that he sent Jesus Christ. You see, we have value. I know it's easy sometimes for us to feel like we don't. And sometimes it's easy for us to, to get down on ourselves. But let me tell you something. God valued you, you enough to come to this earth and die for you. And therefore, all of our value comes from Him. This morning, if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you might be a good person. You might think of yourself as a good person. You might have been successful in a lot of things. But if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, in the end you have no value because our value is all in Him. And if you don't know Him as your Lord and Savior this morning, come, let's talk about it. Give your life to Him. But if you're here this morning and you know Jesus, then the question is, is what do you put value in? What do we... What do we seek? 
What do we seek praise for? Are we giving our praise to Him? What are we worshiping? This morning, make sure that everything you lift up, everything that you praise is because of Jesus. Let's stand this morning. Matthew comes. Lord, we thank you this morning for who you are. We thank you for all the things that you've done. And Lord, we look around and we see that we are failures. We are sinners and we are worthless without you. Lord, we thank you for the fact that you came to die on the cross for us. We thank you, Lord, that you came to pay for our sins and that, Lord, you raise us up and you give us value. Lord, I pray that this morning that you would give a great value to each one here. If, Lord, there's one here that doesn't know you, then today would be their day. In your name we pray. Amen.